Everybody doing good? You got your notes? You ready to, to look at the Word of God this morning? Here we are. We're in Matthew chapter 14. We're in this subject of faith in the storm. And if you've missed the other previous four weeks, you can always go to YouTube and watch them. They're, they're there. We keep them there. Here, here is the way the story unfolds in Matthew, according to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 14, beginning in verse 26. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, him being Jesus, in case you're not familiar with the story, the disciples were terrified. It is a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Aren't you glad that Jesus walks to us in the middle of our storms? There should have been a few more of you saying amen, you need that, okay? Next verse, I love this. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. I love Peter. Y'all like Peter? Yeah. Yeah. You know, Peter is the guy, is, one, is the disciple that gets his mouth going before his brain starts. Maybe that's why I like him, because I've, I've had those moments. Yeah, I mean, if, if you would have been in the middle of the storm and Jesus comes walking to you, Romulo, I mean, I don't think you would have said, let me go walk on the water. I think my request would be like, Jesus, if that's you, would you just tell the wind to shut up? You know? I think the other disciples are probably going like, what? Peter, shut up. And what does Jesus say to Peter's request? One word, come, come. That's all he said was just come. Then what happens? Then Peter got down out of the boat walked on the water and came toward Jesus. Only two men in recorded history have actually walked on water. Jesus and Peter. And for all of you who make fun of him because he drowned, let me tell you what, when you walk on water, you can make fun of the guy who didn't go very far. Okay? Don't criticize somebody just because they they've done more than you have. Thank you. Okay. Next verse, but when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Boy, I love that. I don't know how much you've studied about prayer, but I, I've read lots of books on prayer, gone to seminars on prayer, been in conventions where they talk about prayer, and they tell us all kinds of great ways to pray. Sometimes it's the simple prayer that gets the biggest answer. Lord, save me. Doesn't have to be fancy. You don't have to quote a lot of scriptures. You don't have to get all excited. God heals, hears us when the prayer comes from our heart. Mm, that was good. Thank you. Okay. And so when he said, Lord, save me, immediately Jesus reached out his hand, called him, and said, You of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Holy Spirit, thank you for your presence that has already been with us today. Thank you for this amazing group of people who come to hear your word today. Holy Spirit, you are our teacher and you are our guide. I ask you to take these next few moments. Open our ears that we may hear. Open our minds that we may understand. Open our hearts that we may be transformed by the power of God's Word today. Holy Spirit, we need you today. We need you to change us, to inspire us, to transform us. Thank you for miracles that are going to take place today. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Just turn to somebody next to you and say, I'm glad you're here today. You're going to need this. Now, if you have your outlines this morning of our teaching, 
We're going to talk today about how to walk on water in your storms. Last week, I started this part of the message. We started talking about how that some people walk on top of the water and some people drown in the water. I believe that as a spirit-filled follower of Jesus Christ, regardless of what your storm is, God wants you to learn how to walk on the water. Because when we learn to walk on the water, we begin to discover the destiny that God has for our lives. So last week we talked about the first step to learn how to walk on water is you've got to discern God's voice. There's a lot of other voices in our society. My goodness, how many times do we search Google for the answer instead of searching God? Well, that was a good one. Okay. So you'll have to go listen to that one to get it. Discern the voice of God. Here's the second thing. If you want to walk on water, are you ready for this? You've got to get out of the boat. This isn't rocket scientist. How did Peter walk on the water? He got out of the boat. There's a lot of people who are never going to walk on the water, Pastor Jeremy, because they're not willing to take the step of faith to get out of the boat. But let me tell you something, folks. You're better with Jesus on the water than without Jesus in the boat. And until you discover that, you're never going to discover what it's like to live in the destiny that God has for your life. So... I'm going to unpack that for a little bit for us this morning. As I, as I look at this section of Scripture, I think I thought about six boats that we've got to get out of. So if you have your pens or pencils, or if you want to do it electronically, you can do it that way. I, I'd love for you to jot these six things down, and, and before the morning is over with, some of you can say amen or oh me. Okay, if you say amen, then everybody knows it's for somebody else. If you say oh me, well then they'll know Hey, they're listening to the Lord. Okay, so these are six boats that I, I, in my time of working with people and in my personal life, God has dealt with me about that I have to get out of. Here's number one. The first boat we have to get out of is what I call comfort. Everybody say comfort. Following Jesus Christ was never designed simply to make me comfortable. God is interested in growing my character more than he is in making me comfortable. When Jesus called his disciples to follow him, when Jesus called you and me to follow him, he said part of following Jesus is picking up our cross daily and following him. He didn't say pick up your pillow. He said pick up your cross and it wasn't some gold cross you wear around your neck. It was a cross of suffering and a cross of pain and a cross of humiliation. It was not calling us to comfort. It was calling us to be conquerors. I like what, uh, I don't think I put this on your notes, but this is one of my favorite quotes, that comfort is the cheapest ticket to depression. Those who study human behavior tell me that invariably, A lot of depression simply stems not from overwork, not from too much going on, but simply getting comfortable where you are opens the door for depression in your life. That went over real well. You got to get out of the boat of comfort. Take up your cross. Follow Jesus. Number two, unforgiveness. Everybody say unforgiveness. Unforgiveness. What does the Bible tell us about unforgiveness? Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will what? Not forgive you. You mean my lack of forgiveness for Dan's bad actions has the potential to block God's mercy and grace coming to me? That's how powerful God looks at this issue of forgiveness. Wow, that's a scary thing. And you say, well, pastor, I'll forgive them as soon as they ask for forgiveness. Hello? I like what one man said. 
Unforgiveness is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. Wow. I'm, I'm, I, 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 I'm going to give you some bad news. Are you ready for this? If you live long enough, somebody's going to hurt you. Somebody's going to say something about you. There's going to be something in life that's going to be unfair. It's not going to be just. There are people, sometimes the people that you thought were your closest friends are the ones that are going to stab you in the back. Hello? You doing okay out there? But let me help you out with something, okay? You can't control what people do to you, but you can control your response. I have what I call my Walmart rule. Here's my Walmart rule. It's real simple. If I'm ever in Walmart, I don't want anybody in my life that if I see them, I have to go down the opposite aisle to avoid them. That's my Walmart rule. So if I know that somebody's, if I know there's a problem between me and somebody else, you know what I want to do? I want to go sit down and talk about it. We don't have to totally agree with everything. Hello, there's people that are going to vote different than me. There's people that are going to think different than me. It's okay. But I'm not going to carry the weight of anger and bitterness and resentment because of what someone else has done. Life's too short to walk around with that backpack full. It'll wear you out. But the moment you say, God, here, I forgive this person. Now, I'm going to, here's, here's the way I've learned it, okay? I've just learned that there's some people that I had to pray blessings on their life to get over the bitterness and the anger. And real honest, as a pastor, I know pastors aren't supposed to do this, but there were a few times I prayed that prayer knowing I didn't really mean it. But you know, when I knew I had really forgiven them was the day that I prayed that prayer and in my heart, I knew I meant it. God bless Al Gilbert. Come on. When you can pray for that person who hurt you. Jesus hanging on the cross is our example, right? They had tortured him, whipped him, plucked out his beard, put a crown of thorns on his head, drove nails through his palms and through his feet, and hanging between earth and heaven, Jesus said, Father, forgive them. The old hymn says he could have called 10,000 angels and wiped them all out. But he modeled something for you and me. Even if they nail you on the cross, you still have the power to forgive. And the moment you forgive, you win. As long as you're carrying that backpack of unforgiveness, you're the one who's being weighed down. You're the one who's stuck in the boat. You're the one who's never going to walk on the water because of unforgiveness. And everybody said amen. amen. So we're going we're to deal with the issue of comfort. We're going to deal with the issue of uh, unforgiveness. And here's third one, number three, comparison. Everybody say comparison. Ooh, wow. Look at what the scripture says up here. What are we, Galatians chapter 6, be careful, pay careful attention to your work, for then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done, and you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else. He didn't say pay attention to what everybody else is doing and see if your life matches up to theirs. He just says take care of your business. Do your work the way you should be doing. Live the way you should be living. And then you won't have to compare yourself to other people. It won't bother you what their Instagram says. Oh, let me tell you what, folks. This social media world that you and I live in today is so unfair. Especially for our teenagers and our young adults. And doubly so for our females. Cindy and I raised two boys. We now have three granddaughters and one grandson. I pray for my grandkids every day. And I pray doubly for my granddaughters because I just, I, I, I hate the stuff I see on social media, especially for females. 
so unrealistic. And Satan uses that so hard to mess with the emotions of our teenagers and our young adults and some of our even senior though. Some adults get all caught up trying to live up to somebody else's standard. Hello. Take care. Let the Holy Spirit lead you and guide you in what you're supposed to be doing and celebrate with what somebody else is doing. Pray for them when they're hurting, but don't try to compare yourself with everybody else. You'll never get happy. Okay. Got to get out of the boat of comparison. Number four, we got to get out of the boat of addiction. Everybody say addiction. Addiction. I know this is a whole sermon by itself. Now, I know for some of you, you don't have an addiction. You just have a habit. So, <laughs> if it makes you feel better, call it a habit. You're not addicted to sugar. You just have a habit of eating chocolate cake three times a day. Okay. That's what you want to call it. You're not addicted to coffee. You just have to have those three cups before you can start your day. I know. But I'm telling you what the Bible says about addictions or habits. John chapter 8. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Now, let me, let me pause about that, okay? I believe in the incredible, dynamic power of the Holy Spirit of God. I believe there is power through prayer. There is power through the laying on of hands where God can break any addiction, whatever it is. Drugs, alcohol, gambling, pornography, overeating, overspending, whatever your habit or addiction is that is separating you from the plan of God's life for you. I believe there is a prayer of anointing and of agreeing together that can break that addiction. But there's a difference between being made free and staying free because staying free requires a partnership between you and God and a lot of people are waiting for God to do it all Paul tells us we are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling you know what I think that means that means I've got a part in living free I got three yeses and two nods okay you've got a part in living free if you if you struggled with alcohol in your life stop going to the bar when your buddies after work ask you to stop by for a beer just say no I'm not gonna do that you got an addiction to drugs and you got a bunch of friends that are druggies don't hang out with them oh but I'm gonna win them to Jesus mm, give it some time you can pray for them from a distance you don't need to sit around while they're getting high. How you doing out there? You, you, you got an addiction from overspending? Maybe you need plastic surgery. Just cut up the credit cards. It's amazing how many people I've seen set free with plastic surgery. I had a lady one time I was sitting talking, she had 70 credit cards. She kept switching the monthly payment from one card to another card. It, it, it totally gotten out of control. I said, the first thing we're going to do is have plastic surgery. She says, oh, how am I going to do pay for that? I says, real simple, here's a pair of scissors. We're going to start right here. Be honest with the habits that are keeping you in the boat. The supernatural life that God has for you is not in the boat of addictions or habits, if you feel more comfortable with that term. Oh, wow. Mm, that's, there's good stuff there. Some of you, the Holy Spirit's working on you. You're gonna, it's between you and God, you're gonna need to pray about that. Number five. Fear. Everybody say fear. 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 Probably one of the biggest things that I pray with people about on a regular basis is overcoming fear, worry, depression, anxiety, panic attacks. Oh my goodness. Some people, it's easier for them to believe God to heal them physically than it is to believe God to heal them emotionally. And some of that is, is created by the unforgiveness that we talked about a moment ago. 
and it, and it becomes such an emotional weight that it creates this fear and anxiety and worry and depression. Look at one of my favorite verses of Scripture, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God had, listen, could you, I think we ought to say this one together. Can y'all, y'all can read, right? Okay. Let's read it together. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. Wow. Some of you need to write that one down and memorize it this week. And every time that spirit of fear starts to come, let me tell you what, I have had days where I quoted, my, quoted that to myself out loud multiple times. I went through a whole season where I, I bet at least a dozen times a day I would say that out loud. There have been many at many a 3 o'clock in the morning, 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning, my brain is rushing and raging and thinking of all kinds of stuff, and I'll just lay there and I'll just start quoting that verse out loud over and over and over and over and over until something releases inside of me because there's power in the Word of God. There's power in the Word of God. God has not given you a spirit of fear. Every fear is not from God, it's from the devil. And you, as a follower of Jesus Christ, have the authority to rebuke that spirit of fear and say, in the name of Jesus, that fear does not belong in my life, that anxiety does not belong in my life, that panic does not belong in my life, that depression does not belong in my life. If you want to get out of the boat, you got to get out of the boat of fear. I'm not going to live my life trapped in fear. Number six. Whew, here we go. Wrong relationships. Everybody say it with me. Oh, you guys are good. I love this. What does the Bible tell us? 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 33, the last part of the verse says, bad company corrupts good character. Every parent in the room, you know that, right? You're all worried about who who those people are your kids are hanging out with. And you try to tell you, oh, you shouldn't hang out with him. Every parent believes their child is perfect. The only time they ever get in trouble is when they hang out with the deacon's kids. (laughs) Or with Jeremy's kids, you know, whatever. I knew I could pick on him because he's got awesome kids. He does. He does. It's never your kid's fault. It's who they're hanging out with. Hey, mom and dad, same principle applies to you. Every person who studies human behavior will tell you that if you show me your five closest friends, I'll show you your future. Ooh, come on. That's why it's so important to be a part of a local church body of believers. It's so important to get into a small group with other people that are hungry for God. Surround yourself with people that are going after God instead of going after the world and the things of the world. Hello. Wrong relationships. Let me, let me just take a moment and talk to any of the single people in the room. Teenagers, young adults. Middle-aged adults, if you're single, let me, let me just, this idea of missionary dating is not a biblical process, okay? When, when you're searching for a life partner, let me help you out, okay? It's like fishing. I'll explain this to you. This is going to be a little crude, but you're going to get it. What you catch is determined by two things. I learned this when I was just a kid with my granddad learning how to fish. What you catch is always based on, number one, the bait that you use and the location where you fish. Okay? So some of you young ladies that are complaining that you just keep on catching turds, maybe that's because you've been fishing in a toilet. You're praying for God to give you a godly man and you go hang out at the local bar. Or the strip joint. Hello? That's why we have a young adult ministry. Dan, when do you guys meet? 
Wednesday night, 7 p.m. in the fireside room. You want, if you're looking for a godly man or a godly woman, go find somebody who's going after God. Tinder's probably not the place. Is that still there? They still have that? Whatever, whatever online stuff is. Okay, I'm just telling you, where you fish is going to determine what you catch and the bait you use. I don't want to get legalistic here, but sweetie pie, you might want to look in the mirror. You're wondering why all he's wanting to do is hop in bed with you, sweetie, you know. Change the bait you're using. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is where Cindy is saying, move on, move on, okay. <laughs> what are your relationships? What kind of relationships are you striving after? Who are you choosing to hang out with? And then you say, oh, well, man, I'm trying to be an evangelist. Great. Be an evangelist. Be a witness to the lost world. I'm not saying you can't have some friends who are not yet followers of Christ. But your closest, most intimate friends need to be somebody who's going after Jesus. Because they will trap you in a boat that will keep you from where God wants you to be walking. Come on, that's, that's good stuff, isn't it? So, first off, we're going to learn how to discern the voice of God. Secondly, we're going to learn how to get out of the boat that life has put us in. And here's my third one, and I'm going to wrap up with this. Jeremy's going to come and help me out. Here it is, real simple. Keep our eyes on Jesus. Look at our text. Matthew 14, verse 30. This is talking about Peter. Peter is walking on the water, but it says, when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Now, I, I want you to just look at that, okay? Look at that a moment. When he saw what? Have you ever seen the wind? We don't really see the wind, we see the results of the wind. What he saw was the water being churned by the wind. What he saw was the wind blowing the water into his face. On my personal notes, I put it this way. We have a problem when we focus on the storm instead of the Savior. When we focus on the problem instead of the provider. When we focus on the sickness instead of the healer. When we focus on the pain instead of the Prince of Peace. What you're focused on will determine whether or not you can walk on the water. Back in the early 1900s in London, England, there was a young lady who was quite talented and gifted. The local newspapers had written her up as the upcoming artist for the United Kingdom. She had received full scholarships into the most prestigious art institute in London. Right before she was going to that institute, God got a hold of her heart and she gave up her scholarship to go to Africa, specifically to Northern Africa, to work with a group of unreached people who had never heard the gospel. She was a young lady in her 20s when she left London to make the trip to Northern Africa. For the rest of her life, over 40 years, she spent living and working and ministering the gospel to people who had never heard about Jesus. She corresponded back with her supporters in England by letters and by poems. 
She would often write of the difficulties you can imagine a single female having to learn the language, the culture, and how to communicate Christ to people that had never heard. She wrote a lengthy poem one day about the struggles and the difficulties that she had encountered and how she was able to maintain her joy and her faith in Christ during that. When that poem got back to England, there was another young lady who took that poem and put part of that poem in the form of a song. It became one of the great hymns of the church. As a kid, I grew up singing it in church. It simply said, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. I'm going to ask Jeremy to lead us in that. Would you sing it with me this morning? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look forth in his wonderful face. And the thing. bow your heads with me this morning with your heads bowed would you whisper a prayer and would you just say God what are you saying to me what is God saying right now to you in your journey maybe you're here today and you would be honest enough to say Pastor Darius I know that I'm not where I should be with God today. I need to take a step today. I need forgiveness. The greatest gift that God has given any of us is His Son, Jesus. 2,000 years ago, the Bible said God loved us so much that He gave His Son, Jesus Christ, so that whoever believes in Him would not perish but could have everlasting life whoever that means that regardless of who you are regardless of what you've done regardless of what you have been God loved you so much he sent Jesus to this earth to pay the price for your sins and my sins It's not as important about how you are when you walked in today as it is how you're going to be when you walk out. Because I believe that right now, the love of God is available. So with heads bowed and eyes closed, this is a personal moment between you and God. If you're here today and you say, Pastor Darius, I need forgiveness today. I believe Jesus died for me. I believe he rose again. And I want his forgiveness and I want his freedom in my life. If that's you right now, would you just lift up a hand to say, here, Pastor, include me in this prayer right now. Would you do it? Thank you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Anyone else in the room? Wow, what a great response. Thank you. I see that one way up there in the balcony. I'm going to ask everybody in the room to stand with me right now. You may put your hands down. Everybody stand with me. Everybody looking at me right here. We're about to see something, a miracle of God. 
there's at least seven or eight people in this room who raised their hands saying, today's my day. I'd love to have the privilege to pray with every one of you that just lifted your hands. Let me tell you why I'm doing it this way, okay? I believe there's a miracle of God's grace that happens when we simply take a step toward God. And when we take a step toward God, God in His mercy and grace runs to us. We believe here at Lighthouse in praying for each other and making that declaration. So if you raised your hand today and you say, Pastor Darius, I'm serious, I really mean that. I'd love to invite you to step out from wherever you are, up in the balcony, down here on the floor, and just come and stand with me right down here. If you come, when you come, some other of the church family is just going to come and stand with you. And we're going to have a prayer together. So if you want to come, if you say, I'm serious, this is my day right now, would you just come and join me right here? Come on. Just come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Would you come? Would you come? Give them a hand as they come right now, okay? Come on. Come on. Come on, friend. Come on. Come. Come here. Come here. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Hi. My name's Darius. What's your name? Garcia. What's your name? Excel. Thank you. Good morning, sir. My name's Darius. What's your name? Eric. Thank you for coming, Eric. God bless you. Good morning. Hi, sweet lady. Maria. I met you earlier this morning, didn't I? Thank you, Maria. Thank you for coming. Okay? Just, I want to wait just a moment more. Would you just bow your head while you stand there? God, I come against anything that would separate these right now. Anyone in this room who needs to make this choice, God, let them know how much you love them right now. I break every spirit of pride. I break anything of the enemy that would tell them they're not worth it because, Lord, they are. You love them. You love them today. I can't make the call for you. But if you want to be a part of this moment of prayer, I'd love to invite you to just come and join us. It's your choice. Lord, do your work. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Okay. For everybody in the room, would you join us in a prayer? We're going to talk to God right now. Maybe you've never talked to God before out loud, but we're going to pray out loud because there's something that happens when we confess with our mouth. So church family, for the sake of our friends, would you join us in this prayer? Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, I come in Jesus' name. I confess I am a sinner. I cannot save myself. Today, I ask Jesus to be my Savior and to be my Lord. Forgive me and cleanse me. Holy Spirit, I invite you to take charge of my life. Empower me to be the person you created me to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, Father God, let your mercy and grace flood them today. Let them know that right now transformation is happening. Satan, I rebuke you and your influence. I break every chain of the past. I break every temptation and every sin and I declare freedom in the name of Jesus and for the glory of God. And everybody that agreed said, come on, let's give the Lord a hand right now, okay? Now, those of you that are here, okay, come here. This is Pastor Romulo. He would love and these folks that are standing with you would love to just take a moment and just pray with you. Would you do that? Would you go right that way? Church family, would you give them a big hand right now as they go that way? Thank you. Amen. Okay. Now, here's the prayer moment for all of us. Some of you today, you're a follower of Christ. And you've already made Jesus the Lord of your life, but you know there's some boat that you need to get out of. Because when I was talking, I got to one of those points and something on the inside of you kind of goes, whoops. I know how that feels. I've had that a lot. And sometimes, 
we need to just say yes to that nudge of the Holy Spirit. Last week I told you that the same voice of God who directs us is the same voice that corrects us. And if we refuse to listen to the correction, we won't get the direction, right? So before we change the service and, and move on, I want to take a moment to pray with those. We're going to just do this as a real simple group thing, okay? But if you're here today and you just in honesty say, hey, pastor, I need the courage to get out of the boat I'm in. I'm going to invite you to just come and stand right here with me. You don't have to tell any of us what the boat is. That's between you and God. But by physically walking up here, it's like we're stepping out of the boat. And I believe this week some folks are going to seek God, empower them in ways they've never even noticed before. Come on, start giving the Lord a hand as they come. Hey, man. Awesome moment, man. Hey, Tino. Hey, man. Good to see you again, bro. Okay? Hello, brother. God bless you. Hi, sister. God bless you. Good morning. Thank you. Hi there. Good morning. God bless you. God bless you, friend. Okay? How you doing? Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Church family, would some of you just step and put a hand on? Hi, Dan. Come here, man. Come on, bless you, man. Okay? Good morning for you, man. God chose this day to do something new. It's a new journey. Good morning. God bless you. Okay? We're just, we're, these folks, that, there's some folks right behind you there that love you. They may not even know your name, but you're part of their family because you're part of God's family. Right? And we're going to just take a moment. Would you stretch your hands toward our friends? Lord, I don't know what it may be that they need to get out of, but you do. Lord, you said that you know us so intimately, you even number the hairs on our head. You know our hurts, you know our hang-ups, you know the habits, you know the relationships that need to change. And Lord, we know we can't do that by ourselves, so right now we call upon you, God. We call upon you to empower us with your grace and with your mercy. And Lord, in the name of Jesus, we break every weapon of the enemy. We declare that no weapon formed against them will ever prosper. We declare that greater is he that's within them than he that's in the world. We declare the Holy Spirit today is empowering them. Empowering them to be water walkers today. I break those lies that tell them it's impossible. Those lies that tell them it can't be done. And in Jesus' name, I declare that who the Son sets free is free. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Right now, why don't you just lift up your hands and begin to thank Him. Thank Him for His power right now that is yours. Thank Him by faith and say, God, I thank You because You are working in me. God, You are my God. You are working in me today. You are working in me. You are working in me. You are being released in me today. Hallelujah. Ooh. <laughs> God's working on you. There's a new dream God's getting ready to give you. That dream of the past that you thought was impossible, He's got an even bigger one. It's even bigger. Don't settle for anything small. Walking on water is big. Hallelujah. Let's sing our little chorus one more time. Could you do that for me? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look for in his wonderful face. And the thing.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's a new level of joy for you this morning. Amen. I just sense that in my spirit. You're going to break out with laughing and wonder what's going on. Don't be surprised if you wake up in the middle of the night and start laughing. Because there's going to be a joy coming up inside of you. Amen. Yeah. Believe God heard you this morning. Started something new. Sunday, September the 22nd, 2024. Someday you're going to tell your grandkids about this morning. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Right, Tino? It's going to be a part of your story. Are you going to be baptized next Sunday? I think so. I think you ought to do that. Amen. Come on. You got a lot of folks you want to celebrate that with you, man. Sometimes we got to bury that old man so the new one can come alive in the fullness and the freedom. Give that some thought, bro. Okay. Turn to somebody next to you and say, man, I'm glad you're part of my family. Would you do that? Come on, out there. Just turn to somebody and say, I'm glad you're part of my family. Then you can find your seats.